And what we found was a couple things. Um, when environmental temperature, when it's warm, like now, uh, colostrum yield goes up. Also, the longer the dry period, colostrum yield goes up, except in the winter, okay, in the north. Um, we also found that herds that are further north, so we're talking northern hemisphere now, if we have people in, in Brazil or Argentina listening, the further south you go, um, the less colostrum they make. So it's really interesting. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. I'm Rick Lundquist, your host for this episode. Today as our guest, we have Dr. Peter Erickson, Professor of Dairy Management and Extension Specialist at the University of New Hampshire. And we're going to discuss all things colostrum today. Pete, it's been a while. Yes. And it's great, great to reconnect again. How are you? Yes. Great to see you. Yeah. Pete, I've got a I've got a bio sketch here from you. But rather than having me recite that, uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? and give us some background on your research interests. Okay, so I'm Pete Erickson. I've been a professor here at UNH for going on 27 years. Um, I've had quite a few graduate students, so I think 24, 20, 25 master's students and six PhD students. Um, a lot of my, prior to that, I worked in industry um, across uh, North America, US and Canada. Um, and then in, in 1997, I started here at UNH. I am a dairy nutritionist by training, and I 25% of my time I serve as in extension as a as a dairy specialist. Um, a lot of the work kind of we kind of fell into this work with colostrum. In my prior um, positions, I did a lot of work with heifers, being with the pharmaceutical company that I worked with for a while. So. Um, I did a lot of work with heifers, and I kind of fell into some colostrum work thanks to uh, Jim Quigley, um, who is a UNH alum and pushed some research my way. And uh, I've uh, continued in that in that vein ever since. So initially doing doing baby calf work, but then uh, uh, looking at you know now how to feed that transition cow and how that impacts the colostrum and calf growth and what have you. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. I've lived in uh, central New Hampshire for, oh yeah, like 27 years. So it's in a little farm. So well, good. I'm glad. And I'm, I'm glad we're emphasizing your colostrum work today. You know, it's a uh, uh, <clears throat> good colostrum management's always been a integral part of a good replacement program. But I, I think there's even renewed interest in it now for one one reason, because the price of replacements is so high, and we want to make sure we get them off to a good start. But then now we've got other uh, revenue streams like the beef on dairy revenue stream, you know, and uh, and so I'm I'm sure that these calf buyers will probably uh, you know we're going to look at whether it's a number one or number two calf, and whether the dairy knows. It has got a good colostrum program to get them off to a good start. You might need another, what another couple hundred bucks for a for a, a day old calf, you know. No, it's 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 remarkable, and a lot of things that we have taken for granted um, really kind of uh, come to the forefront a little bit. And you know, even just how we feed that calf on day one, if we're talking a dairy heifer, uh, can impact how much milk she makes. Two, three, four years down the road, which is which blows my mind. But anyway, <laughs> and I've certainly seen that too. I have some custom heifer raisers that I work with, and boy, they can. It, it's a tough choice when they get a when they get a heifer that comes to them, and, and it's they could tell that it's it's one of these poor doers. And then you know, and uh, do you continue to put money into this animal, or do you cut the cord early? You know, so it really uh, it's an important part of the program. Right. Right. And now we even we even have another revenue stream, the human market, right? For cosmetics and for supplements. Who who would have who would have thought? You know. Well, I know someone who who started a a company several years ago. I I I, I won't mention her name, 
but she used to tell me she'd take uh, powdered colostrum every day, a, ta- a tablespoonful. So it's it's crazy, but yeah. Well, and you know, but there's such a lot of good things in it, and it kind of makes some sense, I guess. So it does, yeah, certainly makes some sense. The next giant leap in dairy profitability is here. Introducing AffiCollar feed efficiency service from AffiMilk, the first sensor to accurately measure individual cow dry matter intake. Combined individual feed consumption with milk production data to get profitability insights never before available. Hear from producers who are using it to make a big impact on profitability and sustainability at AffiMilk.com. That's A-F-I-M-I-L-K.com. Well, having said that, um, what uh, what kind of recommendations do you have to maximize colostrum yield and quality? So that's a big deal. Um, we've run into this, and I don't know. Um, it seems to have garnered its problem, or you know, developed its problem with the Jersey breed. However, it looks like the Holsteins are actually. Uh, have more of a problem with lack of colostrum yield. There was a really good study out of Texas, actually out of Washington State, but the research was done in Texas. And um, they looked at Jersey cows, and it was like in the month of December, multi paris Jersey cows produce hardly any colostrum. And so what's what's causing this? You know, the first thing you think of, well, it might be photo period, right? Um I don't think it is. I think it's environmental temperature. Um, we did a big study with with uh, cows from across the U.S. and um, we looked at all these different variables. And what we found was a couple things. Um, when environmental temperature, when it's warm, like now, uh, colostrum yield goes up. Also, the longer the dry period, colostrum yield goes up, except in the winter, okay, in the north. Um, We also found that herds that are further north, so we're talking northern hemisphere now, if we have people in in Brazil or Argentina listening, the further south you go, um, the less colostrum they make. So it's really interesting. There's some data, and I know the Europeans uh, are, are talking about this, where prolactin has to be released the day at parturition to convert from colostrogenesis to lactogenesis, from colostrum production to milk production. And when it's cold, prolactin is dampened. So we don't get the spike that's needed. So we're actually looking at a bunch of cows right now on three or three herds here in New Hampshire over the year, and we're monitoring temperature, colostrum yield, and uh, prolactin and estradiol concentrations in the um, in in the blood, and then colostrum yield and IgG in the in the in the cow. So it's kind of an interesting interesting um, thing, and there's a lot of data that indicates the longer the dry period, for the most part, the more colostrum she will make. So this plan of having shorter dry periods back 10, 15 years ago, you might remember that where everybody was like, oh, we don't need to give them a dry period. That really did not bode well for 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 colostrum production at all. And so, you know, 60 days, we go back to where we were originally trained is, is about right. If you go a little longer, if you're worried about it, you know, dry cow off 10 days earlier, you know, it probably would 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 help. So I've talked to some producers that have done that, and it's been it's been it's been good. So it's that's interesting. The nutritional aspect of it, um, there's there's a lot of data that's kind of on the fence. An interesting one is protected choline. There was data um, indicating that choline can actually stimulate um, IgG yield and uh, and colostrum yield protected choline and the authors think it has to do with basically the conversion of choline to methionine and there's a there's a i think 14 methionine residues in an immunoglobulin g so it kind of makes sense that 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 would happen um and there's i think only three studies so the jury's a little bit out on that so um it's it's not 
the nutritional aspect of it is is not as clear cut as one would think. So, and and there's again not a lot of research on that aspect, especially colostrum yield. That's really so. That's kind of the thing we're looking at. Again, an interesting topic, and I'm happy to see you again. It's been a while, and it's been a while. Hopefully, we can do another one of these if you're available. Sounds good. Sounds good. I look forward to it. Thank you.